Hello, welcome to day two of the University of Southern California and Tsinghua University Faculty Research Symposium on data analytics and analysis, sorry, and informatics. Uh, good evening to those of you joining us today in Los Angeles and good morning to those of you joining us in Beijing. Uh, if you are tuning in for the first time today, we're glad to have you as we have seven accomplished professors here to share their research with us today. After each presentation, time permitting, the speaker will answer a few questions from the audience. So throughout the presentation, please enter your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, this symposium is also being recorded and will be sent to you as soon as it's posted. Our first presenter today is Andrea Armani. Dr. Armani is the Ray Arani Chair in Chemical Engineering and Materials Science and Professor of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science, Biomedical Engineering, Electrical and Computer Engineering, Electrophysics, and Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Armani will be presenting today on Emergency Engineering, Translating Innovation into Impact. Please join me in welcoming to this, the Zoom virtual stage, Dr. Armani. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mara. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and joining. Uh, I know it's early in the morning in Beijing right now. Um, but thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk today um, a little bit about some of the research that's been going on in my group um, that leverages kind of our past uh, experience in optics and expertise in optics, as well as um, our interest, um, kind of like the global interest, um, in trying to come up with uh, improved and lower cost methods of disinfection. And this work was done both in our research group as well as uh, at the Keck School of Medicine, which is the health science campus of USC, um, as well as working in close collaboration with uh, local industry in LA, uh, specifically a company called SMP Engineering. Uh, because at least in Los Angeles right now, um, we're just beginning to open back up. And in fact, my labs just opened yesterday. So uh, research right now is very synergistic between academics and industry in order to really move things forward. Um, and again, you know, every, but every research uh, project really starts with the students and the researchers because they do pretty much everything. Um, so I'd really like to thank the research students that worked on this project, um, specifically Dong Yu and Lexi, um, who are in, highlighted in, in the gold squares because um, they, they really uh, kind of spearheaded a lot of this work. Um, again, as well as SMP Engineering and uh, Rosemary Shea on the Health Science Campus at USC. Um, so taking a, a step back, because I know uh, yesterday was spent very much on modeling efforts and trying to understand uh, COVID from a, a theoretical and viral spread perspective. Um, and today we're kind of moving more into the hardware side. Uh, so trying to understand what viral disinfection is, um, you first have to understand the virus. Um, so the three key functions um, that a virus needs to sustain in order to survive. Um, the first is to actually be able to maintain a spike protein which is on the surface of the virus. And this protein allows it to identify and attack um, healthy cells. Uh, the second uh, is a capsid. So this is kind of that protective shell around the virus. And this allows it to maintain its stability um, outside of uh, kind of a nice, normal, healthy environment. And then the third is RNA um, for COVID. Um, or if you want to think broader picture in terms of disinfection, you could also think DNA for bacteria. Um, so when you start thinking about trying to design a disinfection method, you, you think about um, trying to tackle or destroy um, one of these key features. Uh, because if you're able to destroy them, then your subject, so the virus or the bacteria, is no longer effective. Uh, 
So the kind of the four main strategies that are typically used for viral disinfection um, can be broken down into their mechanisms. Um, so heat or thermal. Um, and thermal mechanisms are usually actually targeting that spike protein on the surface. Um, there's chemical methods like chlorine, bleach, uh, hydrogen peroxide. And those methods are actually very, very effective at targeting the RNA. Um, then there's ozone. And ozone is one of the most effective uh, cleaning methods. It can actually destroy every component of a virus. However, ozone is also incredibly toxic to the environment. Um, and it can, just like it destroys all the components of the virus, it can also be very toxic to um, just whatever you're trying to disinfect, right? So if you're trying to disinfect like an N95 mask, um, the ozone can also damage the mask surface. Um, and then there's the fourth category or radiation. And radiation includes UVC radiation. It could also include microwave radiation. Um, so UVC radiation targets the RNA as well as that capsid shell. Um, so we're going to focus mainly on UVC radiation today. However, um, there's obviously been a lot of work. I want to get rid of all this. There we go. There's obviously been a lot of work um, done in the past on UVC radiation well in advance of COVID-19. And part of the reason is that UVC is very effective as a broad spectrum disinfectant. Um, and antibiotic resistance is an emerging threat. Um, in the US, uh, there has been significant increase of spread in healthcare settings, um, as well as community spread for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And the application of using uh, UVC disinfectant methods as a way to combat that community spread um, was kind of one of the initial uh, instigators of developing a lot of the handheld UVC methods that have become very popular recently. Um, so this is just kind of a, a way of saying that just because you know all of these UVC technologies are being developed now for COVID, they will have a much larger impact even beyond this current pandemic. Uh, it's not going to end now. Uh, so how does UVC work? Um, so this actually gets to basic biology, which you may or may not remember depending on the last time you had a biology class. Um, so DNA is a double helix. RNA is a single helix. Um, they are comprised of pyrimidines and purines. Um, so the purines are your adenine and your guanine, and adenine and guanine are present in both DNA and RNA. And pyrimidines are cytosine, which is present in both, um, uracil, which is only in RNA, and thymine, which is only in DNA. And the pyrimidines um, absorb very strongly in the UVC wavelength range. And the reason why that is important is because they not only absorb light, but when UVC is exposed to the pyrimidine groups, they actually do something called dimerizing. So instead of uh, forming bridges like they're supposed to, um, and the A and T and G and Cs binding with each other, they will actually kink and self-bind. Um, so instead of having you know, your guanines and thymines binding, you end up with thymines and thymines binding. And this fundamentally inhibits something called transcription, which is when your DNA or RNA replicate. And if your DNA and RNA can't replicate, then your virus can't replicate. And if the virus can't replicate, then the virus dies. So it's a very fundamental way of disrupting or killing a virus. Um, there are you know, lots of different ways um, that have been developed to leverage UVC in a disinfection setting. Um, so the conventional way uh, uses something that looks kind of like a microwave. Um, it's small, has a flip open door. Um, it, they're you know, several thousand dollars. Kind of one of the challenges that the source for the replacement bulbs is a fixed source. Um, and 
uh, having a single source supplier for UVC bulbs right now in the US where there's kind of a shortage was a, a limitation. And then kind of the other extreme um, is basically trying to reuse or repurpose biosafety cabinets. Um, and that's become incredibly popular uh, right now because they, they're they very large, very open. You can put large structures inside of them. Um, so right now, if we're doing rapid recycling of N95 masks, a lot of researchers are looking at basically repurposing their biosafety cabinets as these large aerated uh, chambers. Um, but we wanted to try to come up with something that uh, was less expensive, had a little bit more flexibility built intrinsic to it, um, and also didn't require any kind of infrastructure to be already in place. Um, and just to kind of give a, a sense of what type of numbers you need, um, usually uh, you want to try to hit a uh, UVC dose of around 100 millijoules per centimeter squared for a virus and around 10 millijoules per centimeter squared for a bacteria. Um, and obviously that's going to vary a little bit depending on the specific virus and depending on the specific bacteria, but those are kind of typical benchmark goals. Um, so one of our main or initial motivators was actually beginning to see pictures like this. Um, so this is Central Park in New York City. Um, and due to the overcrowding in the hospitals in New York, uh, they basically had to put up field tents. Um, and obviously when you start having field tents, um, it becomes a significant issue on you know, what do you do with all the waste products? Um, what do you, how do you maintain a sterile environment? How do you disinfect PPE? Because you no longer have all of those biosafety cabinets. Um, you know, how, how are you actually maintaining that normal, uh, clean medical care facility in what is effectively a campsite? Um, so we wanted to develop something that could enable healthcare workers to maintain that disinfected, clean environment in an outdoor community. Uh, so the first thing uh, that we you know, started with was, well, you're going to need a disinfectant source. So we uh, went and purchased a UVC bulb. Um, now, if you have a single bulb uh, that has you know, no kind of reflective coating, it's basically going to interact with whatever's inside the chamber a single time. If you have a slight coating um, or a little bit of reflectivity, uh, you can then anticipate that you'll get an amplification of whatever that uh, initial power was. Uh, so in order to improve the use of the power that our bulb was using, uh, we took and uh, coated the inside of our box with uh, chrome spray paint. So it turns out chrome spray, spray paint is actually aluminum and aluminum has up to 90% reflectivity at 260 nanometers. So it essentially forms something called a Fabry-Perot optical cavity, um, which is basically just when the light is able to resonate or bounce back and forth in between uh, two sides, you end up with an amplification of that incident light. So we did a little bit of modeling um, looking at, you know, can we design, can we optimize the placement of the bulb? Can we optimize the dimensions of the system? Um, exactly how long do we need to expose our sample? Um, where, where should we place the sample within the chamber, within the box? Um, and we looked at three kind of different conditions. The first was assuming we had zero reflectivity. In other words, every photon would leave the bulb and then immediately get absorbed by the box. Um, one where the walls had 25% reflectivity, which is kind of a lower bound estimate. And then the other is 85% reflectivity, which is kind of approaching that ideal because aluminum, again, can have up to 90% reflectivity, but that's in an ideal setting. So we're kind of assuming our experiments are gonna fall somewhere between this 25 to 85% reflectivity boundary. Um, and then these calculations were performed assuming one minute of exposure time. Um, and so based on the calculations, uh, you can see that uh, between 25% and 85%, everywhere within the box, we were able to easily uh, achieve over 100 millijoules uh, per cm squared uh, exposure. And this is just taking and plotting out a single point. Um, 
So if you look at the dose as a function of time, um, and this point is in the center of the box at the very bottom of the box. Um, so if you look at the dose as a function of time, as you, you know, expose longer and longer, you get a higher and higher dose. And these are three different light sources. So one's a 10 watt, one's a 15 watt, one's an 18 watt bulb. Um, and this is comparing the thresholds needed to kill uh, four different types of pathogens. So two are bacteria, so anthrax and E. coli, and then two are viral. Uh, so the adenovirus and the norovirus. Um, and usually bacteria have, uh, they, they don't need as strong of a dose, um, but in this case, because anthrax is uh, a very um, stable uh, bacteria, it actually requires a slightly higher dose. Um, but these are kind of the standard thresholds that have been demonstrated by other researchers using UVC previously. Uh, so this, this graph kind of gave us our initial guess of exactly how long we would anticipate needing to expose our samples um, in our system. So we started with uh, this system um, and we wanted to test it out on face shields, but obviously right now face shields are somewhat precious. So we looked at what the plastic on the face shield is. We then mimicked it with a Petri dish. Um, we put uh, our bacteria as our test system. Then we exposed it for a series of different times or series of different doses. Uh, then we replated the bacteria on a Petri dish that actually had agar on growth media. And then we waited 24 hours and then we counted the colonies. Uh, and then this is the data that we took in our system. Um, so if we didn't treat it or didn't expose it to any UV, uh, we saw a lot of growth. Um, if we did expose it for even as short a time as one minute, um, we saw over a three log reduction. And in two of the samples, um, we saw absolutely no growth. So it was no detectable growth. Um, three minutes, there we didn't see anything in any of the three samples. And at six minutes, we saw a few cells in one of the samples. Um, so we, we then you know, started basically sending these out um, to various uh, hospitals and small clinics around LA. Uh, and then since then, uh, we've both sent them out. Um, and by we, I mean the, the company that our group's working with, as well as um, we've helped a lot of other researchers kind of around the world build their own systems. So uh, the, the faculty member who's speaking after me, SK Gupta, is going to talk about um, working on combining this kind of technology with a, a semi-autonomous system, which is something I'm personally really excited about as well. Um, so I will stop here and answer any questions. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, <laughs> So uh, if anyone has any questions, I, I don't see any listed here. Um, so last chance to our attendees. If not, we can move on to- I have a quick question. Oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So do you, the, the system you built is like a handheld device or it's like a box? It's, it's, a, it's a box. So it's, um, it's a, about a three pound plastic tub and it weighs about three pounds, including everything. Um, so there was a picture, which I'm now no longer sharing my screen, um, but th there there was a picture. So um, you put one mask at a time and- So we can actually fit three masks. Okay. Yes, and we have done some measurements with N95 or KN95 masks, and we didn't see any change in the filtration efficiency after, um, 42 cycles. I think we're at 42 right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay. I, I oh. was going to say, but right, right before we go, um, one of my new PhD students is is watching. So I, I want to say hi to him. So uh, even and, though he can't say hi back, I'm still going to say hi to him. And we do have uh, one last question. Can you describe details on how your simulation studies were conducted? Yes. 
Um, so we actually used uh, an analytical, so we wrote an analytical expression for um, an optical plane wave coming out of the light bulb. So the light was characterized as being a spherical uh, light source. Um, previous work had characterized the actual light emitting from the bulb. So we used a plane wave uh, analytical expression, um, put it into MATLAB, um, analytically calculated it, um, then uh, assumed up to four reflections off the side of the, of the uh, tub, um, and then plotted it. So it, it wasn't like FEM modeling, uh, finite element method modeling or FDTD modeling or anything like that. It was uh, analytical. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Armani. Uh, I would now like to um, bring up, um, whoops, sorry, uh, S Dr. S.K. Gupta, who is a professor in the aerospace and mechanical engineering department at USC Viterbi School of Engineering, and he is also the director for the Center for Advanced Manufacturing. He will be presenting on uh, realizing next generation additive manufacturings through the use of advanced robotics. So please welcome uh, Dr. Gupta. Uh, thanks, Meta. Uh, I'm gonna actually present something slightly broader. So uh, just wanna confirm, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I must have an old abstract. <laughs> no, no, no problem. So I'm going to present something slightly broader, which will include additive, but will include some other pieces as well. So that's kind of my game plan. Uh, all right. So uh, again, uh, thank you very much for you know attending uh, this presentation. And I would like to begin by again acknowledging all my students and postdocs uh, who have actually done the actual work behind what I'm gonna present. So, so let's just use robotic disinfection as a motivating example. Majority of my work is in the manufacturing uh, applications, basically using robot manufacturing applications. And today I will largely focus on some bit of machine learning and data anal analysis and informatics aspect of the work. But let's use robotic disinfection as a motivating example. So, uh, you know, as Andrea was mentioning, disinfection is an important uh, topic nowadays, and uh, and we'll figure, need to figure it out how to perform disinfection in an effective way. And UVC and chemical sprays are potential methods. So we believe that you know robot can help quite a bit in increasing capacity and keep humans safe in doing disinfection. And if you start surveying what's available in market, there are several robot. Uh, so UVD and Xanax are two popular brand of robot which are available, which basically carry UVC light source and then use that to perform disinfection. These are already being deployed uh, in, in a wide variety of settings. Limitations of these technologies is that, you know, uh, the way these robots work, that these are mobile platform, they basically move around and whatever is visible to these uh, UVC sources, that's the area which is gonna get disinfected. But if you think about any kind of human inhabited space, you are gonna have lots of objects and artifacts in the space and those cannot get disinfected by these type of robots. So typically you need to manipulate objects. So you need to move things around, uh, make surfaces accessible to UVC light in order for it to work. Or even if you were gonna use chemical spray type of thing, similar kind of thing is there, you really need to kind of do object manipulation. So we believe that we will need truly mobile manipulators to get this job done. So mobile manipulators are basically a mobile base which can move around and then a robotic arm attached to it. It could be one arm or it could be multiple arms attached to it. And then the idea is that by coordination between the arm and the base, you can actually place your light source uh, at different locations. An arm can also open doors, uh, you know, enable 
the base platform to reach to different locations and also arm can pick up objects and can perform disinfection. So we believe that this combination would be what will be needed if we really want to uh, perform effective disinfection in human inhabited spaces. Now, in terms of autonomous operation, I mean, mobile platform, the significant level of autonomy currently exists. People are able to go from point A to point B in autonomous mode. But on the other hand, if you think about robotic arms, level of autonomy for robotic arm is a lot less. I mean, you really require humans to program the robot, robotic arm, and which is again require a lot of time and cost. And these robots which have been coded by human operators are not adaptable. They are just gonna simply you know, play back whatever the code has been uh, entered into it. So robots, this video, which one which was playing on the slide shows that robots are physically capable of doing amazing things. However, if you think about broadly the manufacturing application where robotic arm get used a lot, I mean, they only get used in a high production setting where people can program robot once and get them to work for a long period of time. If we really want to use robot, uh, robotic arm or mobile manipulators, which are even more complex than robotic arm, then we really need smart robotic assistants. I mean, we need robot to be able to program themselves. I mean, there's no question about human programming robot to perform certain kind of motions. Robot should be able to sense the environment. Human should be able to task them at a high enough level, but robot then should be able to figure it out how the motion needs to happen. Oftentimes, when robots start interacting with the environment, those interactions basically will provide some data or information to the robot. And robot should be able to then use that information to improve its performance. So in general, one could say that robots should be able to conduct their own experiments and then learn from it. Robots should also be able to ensure safe execution because any kind of sensing that you're gonna use is gonna have inherent uncertainty. And of course, environment will also have obstacles which might be moving or some other things might be happening. So we really wanna make sure that robot can be safe and when needed, robots should be able to seek help from humans because if humans have to all the time watch the robot, then this whole idea about robot enhancing capacity simply would not be feasible because then each robot will chew up the time from one human. So that's not simply economically viable. So the model should be that robot should work on its own. When it needs help, it will seek help from humans. And when human and robot interaction will begin to happen, then robots need to be able to communicate with human in an effective way, rather than dumping all the data which human would not be able to you know, consume or make use of it. Robot should be able to figure it out what's important and it should basically provide that data to the human. So the work that goes on in our group is basically focused on realizing useful uh, smart robotic assistant. And there are five major pieces to it. So one piece is, of course, robotics, which is novel platforms, new mechanism, new control uh, principles, advanced sensing, grippers. So all the advances which are happening on the sensing control hardware side of it. So we, we exploit all of it. The other end of it is AI, because if robot has to program itself, a robot has to basically decide when it's going to need uh, help from human, then it needs advanced AI, which includes perception, planning, reasoning, and learning. And since robots will have to interact with humans in many of the application areas, then we need better human machine interface. So that would include augmented reality, safety, teleoperations, and finally, application context, because without thinking about how robots are gonna be used and what robots will be doing and what kind of risk can be taken, uh, what kind of environment robots are gonna be experiencing, we really can't deploy robots. 
So to build useful smart robotic assistant, our group looks at all these four aspects, robotics, HMI, AI, and application context. So what our group does is that we build physics aware AI for realizing a smart robotic assistant. And that has five fundamental capabilities. Uh, so the first one is automated task and motion planning to enable robots to program themselves. And that's going to be the major thing that I'm going to you know, describe today. The other capabilities are self-directed learning, intelligent control, introspection, and basically exchanging information with humans. But those topics I would not cover today. So let me just quickly show you this robotic uh, disinfection video, which uh, utilizes uh, many of these technologies that I mentioned. And then I will give you a little bit more information about uh, how all these technologies work. So this is basically a mobile manipulator uh, being designed where we're going to have two kind of UV light source on it. There'll be a column type of source so that will have the capability of conventional UVD or Xanax type of robot. And it will also have a UV wand so that when arm can interact with the obstacles or object in the scene and expose the surface, then robot can also use the UV wand to perform the disinfection. So this robot will support uh, both uh, modes. So that, that's the, our intention. So in this case, uh, this mobile manipulator then allows us to basically have the benefit of this uh, large uh, column type of UV source to do overall gross infection. And it then also allows you to use the arm to manipulate the object in the world and then uh, basically use the wand to do a more fine scale uh, disinfection. So that way you can actually uh, perform effective disinfection in human inhabited environment. So that's the technology that we are working. It's semi-supervised because we always want a human to be able to uh, provide input and uh, basically intervene or guide the robot or task the robot. So that's the intent behind this system. So I'm going to pause this video here. It's posted on our website. So if you want to check it out, you can check it out on our website. So I'll stop sharing that video and go back to sharing my PowerPoint. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, what I would like to cover briefly is basically our work on uh, capability number one, which is robot that can program themselves. So we have developed technology for tragic, you know, point to point trajectory planning in a highly cluttered environment. Now this is extremely hard problem. And therefore it requires, you know, basically space-tized approaches. So if you use approaches which are optimization based or simply sampling based or uh, search based approaches, unfortunately, uh, you either don't get very good quality path or you fail often. So our goal is that we want to be able to generate reasonably good quality path in a really fast manner. And that's where we bring in basically machine learning. So what machine learning does is that it analyzes the context uh, of the surrounding space, both in terms of configuration space of the robot and the workspace. And then it basically utilizes the right kind of heuristics uh, to conduct the experiment. And we have done testing on some very challenging problem and it shows that our method by combining machine learning uh, with uh, different kind of planning techniques, we can actually produce very good quality path and we can actually solve the problems which otherwise cannot be solved. So this video shows now some of the examples where we are able to solve you know, really uh, challenging uh, problems. So the other uh, interesting thing sometimes you have to do is path constraint trajectory planning where tool has to move on a surface and you have a high degree of freedom system sometime a mobile manipulator where base is moving and a tool is being moved by an arm or two different robotic arm collaborating. 
So this is the problem where we basically use more optimization-based method. And again, we marry in this case, machine learning and optimization-based method to enable us to basically adaptively search in those neighborhoods uh, where constraints are failing. And then we can apply also constraints in a, uh, you know, in a, in a successive manner. So this then allows us to solve fairly challenging you know, problem with a high degree of freedom systems. Uh, where we can successfully generate uh, path constraint trajectories. Uh, another interesting thing that uh, we need to work on is basically a trajectory uh, compensation problem because robots are highly repeatable. However, robot accuracy is not that good. Uh, unlike machine tools or 3D printer, robot accuracy is often 10 times worse than the repeatability. So that means that if you are going to be using robot, uh, and you're going to be generating trajectory uh, using uh, some kind of AI, then if trajectory does not uh, you know, produce accurate results, then nobody will use the robot. So again, in this case, we use machine learning uh, by dynamically online sampling robotic trajectory and devising a customized compensation scheme. And that then allows us to basically create uh, trajectories which are highly accurate. Uh, so in this case, the demonstration is showing that if you take a commercial arm and basically run a trajectory on it, then you're going to have large accuracy. So we have this moving platform example where we showed you that there's a large gap. But if you apply this compensation scheme by online robot conducting some of its own experiments and then use a machine learning to train basically neural net to provide the compensation scheme, then we can actually dramatically reduce that error. Also, because of uncertainty, when you are trying to do mobile manipulation, uh, if you don't regulate gripper speed in the vicinity of the object that you're trying to pick, in that case, you may crash into objects. So again, in this case, we use machine learning uh, to understand how uncertainty interacts with the gripper speeds and how gripper speed should be regulated to cope with uncertainty. So this video actually shows that, uh, you know, uh, that you can uh, grasp things from a moving platform. So the initial the video was showing that if you don't regulate the speed, then you'll be able to crash into things. But if you can regulate the speed in the vicinity of the object, then the object aligns itself in the gripper and despite uncertainty, you'll be able to you know, pick it up. We work in a wide variety of different application area, right from you know, basically bin picking, fitting to finishing, composite layup, editive. Uh, so one interesting application that I can show you is composite layup. The composite layup currently of the sheet layup is done by hand. It's an extremely challenging problem. So again, in this case, we are able to- The robot itself is smart and it can adapt to uncertainties during the layup process. The cell uses AI algorithms. They provide the cell with high level strategy to generate good quality plans. The robotic cell is smart. So this then allows us to basically use three robots which collaborate and can actually do the you know, pre-packed sheet layer, which requires handling you know, compliant materials. So this, this particular problem you know, is quite complex. The other interesting things that we do is basically, you know, we use a robot for 3D printing. So again, 3D printers, when you use 3D grid freedom system, that means that you can create, approximate any geometry uh, and can create parts, but you don't get adequate strength, particularly if you are working with any kind of composite material. So what we have done is that we have basically are able to, uh, you know, use robotic AM where we put the print head in the robot that allows us lots of benefits. We can actually create uh, 10 times superior mechanical strength we can actually tilt the part, avoid basically support structure. So we have many, many benefits of being able to do that, right? And also we have built a system where a single robot can have multiple different print head that allows us to do multi-resolution printing. So we can give you very good surface 
finish while speed up, you know, build performance quite a bit. Uh, so in conclusion, basically, uh, you know, realizing smart robotic assistant requires advances in AI, HMI, and robotics. Uh, we have to pay a lot of attention to application context uh, because that often determines what kind of models to use, what kind of safety to apply, and what kind of interfaces to design. And there are five building blocks of realizing a smart robotic assistant, which include basically automated task and motion planning so that robot can program themselves from task descriptions, self-directed learning so that robot can conduct experiments, intelligent control so that robot can execute tasks safely under uncertainty, Robots should have introspection capabilities so that they can seek help from human. And when they need to interact with human, then they should utilize the context aware information exchange so that they can work e efficiently with human. Uh, all this work that I described happens in USC Center for Advanced Manufacturing. Work has been funded by NIST, NSF, ONR, DARPA, ARL, Air Force, and ARM Institute. And we work with a wide variety of different companies, uh, such as ABB, KUKA, Hexagon, Yaskawa, Lockheed, PRC, Boeing, and uh, Cytec. So with that, I'm going to conclude and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, are there any questions from uh, panelists? Or uh, I don't see any in the Q&A. Yes, I have a quick question, SK. Sure. Um, I know you were working on uh, under this COVID condition, you know, disinfecting hospitals and things difficult. So we're looking into robots going and cleaning the thing. Is that happening? So, I mean, we are still developing and maturing our technology. So we have not yet deployed it, but we continuously, you know, continue to refine the technology in the lab right now. Eventually we have to really, you know, get that testing done uh, in, in a, some DL lab before we can actually talk about uh, deploying. And that's where we are going to start uh, collaborating with Andrea and see how we can you know, take the lab robot from our lab and actually start exploring uh, deployment. OK, great. Thank you so much. Um, we now will move on to our next presenter unless there are any last questions. Uh, nope, doesn't look like it. Okay, thank you so much again, Dr. Gupta. Uh, I would now like to welcome to the program uh, Shang Zhao. Dr. Zhao is an associate professor with the Department of Electrical Engineering at THU. His research interests include vehicular networks and green wireless communications. He will be presenting on timely communication and computing for connected vehicles. Please welcome Dr. Zhao. Sorry, sorry, I, I okay. just realized I was muted. Uh, so can you see my uh, screen sharing? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm very glad here to, uh, to introduce our work um, in this uh, workshop. So, uh, so I'm going to talk today as about timely communication and commuting for connected vehicles. So this work is a joint work with our, my students uh, Zheng Xi, Shi Wenqi, Sun Yuxuan, Jia Yuquan, and my colleague, Professor Zhisheng Niu. <clears throat> so I have, I have seen that many of the talks of this joint workshop is about uh, the, is related to COVID-19. Actually, uh, so my talk today is somehow is also related to, to, that, to the epidemic right now, because uh, as you can see in this uh, pandemic, so the autonomous vehicles has played an important role like in delivering uh, important uh, groceries and uh, necessities for uh, medicine necessities. Uh, so, so that's it's. Uh, so my talk today is uh, is quite closely related to these uh, autonomous vehicles and uh, in general um, the robotics. <clears throat> so talking about autonomous driving. So, uh, 
as we can see that uh, so current, current uh, autonomous driving are mostly based on uh, standalone intelligence. But uh, for standalone intelligence, the, the major weakness is that they have the similar weakness as human drivers, because um, even for autonomous driving, if, if it is based on standalone intelligence, it, it has limited view and sensing range. And also the, the detection pre precision is also quite limited due to the limited computation capabilities on each vehicle. And also because there is no coordination among vehicles, the traffic efficiency can be quite low. Therefore, uh, because my background is wireless communications, from my point of view, uh, allowing vehicles to talk to each other, uh, to share their sensing and the computing resources via uh, V2X communications can actually enhance uh, the autonomous driving substantially. Uh, for instance, we can allow uh, di different applications like blind spot warning uh, from <clears throat> roadside sensors. And also we can uh, achieve some uh, um, scenarios like see-through, for instance, the cam the, the, the front, uh, so the, the, the vehicle in front of you can send it the, the video uh, of its front cameras back to the follower vehicles so that as from the follower vehicle's point of view, the, the vehicle in front of him is like transparent so that it, it plays like a see-through scenario. And also we can allow collaboration among many different vehicles so that we can enhance not only the sa safety of autonomous driving, but also we can um, improve the efficiency of the traffic. But the key here is that as you can imagine, uh, uh, since we, are, um, we have to share the information among vehicles, therefore, and also we are dealing with uh, driving, which should uh, which should be the decision should be done very in a timely manner. So the information delivery uh, should uh, should satisfy the timeliness requirements of these uh, applications. But as you can imagine, that uh, currently, if you have if you heard about five G, so the uh, for this uh, autonomous driving or even like uh, uh, some smart manufacturing. Uh, five, the solution from 5G is that they provide ultra reliable and low latency communications, in short, UILLC. Um, so they claim that they can achieve uh, like one millisecond, uh, one millisecond latency with like, with uh, very high reliability, but uh, it's just a target. As far as I know, all these uh, tests that can achieve this uh, uh, quality of service are only done in a very overly ideal scenarios. And it is also hard to achieve in V2X where we have limited wireless resources and also we have randomness in like vehicle access and in channel, et cetera, because we also have a, a volatile topology in the vehicular networks. And also we have done some experiments that uh, based on current LTE V2X uh, mode four, um, Mac, that uh, if we, we, we want to have very high reliability within a uh, very low uh, latency, that we, uh, the spectrum that we are going to use is not scalable. It's, uh, it can be 100 times as we expected uh, from our theory. So therefore, we, uh, the solution here is that uh, we should use, the basic idea is that we should use the wireless resources wisely. For instance, if you just naively uh, want to uh, send message, for instance, in this case, uh, send your position very frequently that you wanted to uh, achieve low latency, but due to the limited wireless resources, you, you are going to encounter many collisions. Ultimately, it ends up uh, an outdated information of your uh, position for these two vehicles. But alternatively, if you uh, if you take the context into into account that uh, the location of the vehicles are more important uh, when the vehicles are, are approaching the intersection, so you just transmit when the vehicle is uh, closing to the uh, intersection. You use less wireless resources, uh, and and you you are going going to have high uh, successful probability success probability. So therefore, you you are going you ultimately will end up with more fresh information about your location. 
so uh, basically, uh, uh, so uh, so we should look at because the wireless communication in this scenario is in the closed loop of sensing communication and the control. Uh, for instance, you are uh, you have a real world situation here, but based on the local sense in the V2X communications, you are going to reconstruct the the, the the real world based on your observation. And then you based on your observation, you make the computing and make the control decision. And and then it, it will have some impact backwards to the, uh, to the environment. So the communication is, is uh, one part of this closed loop. So therefore we should, when we when we do this wireless communication uh, this, uh, optimization, we should take into account the the impact from the communication to the uh, to the performance of the computing and the control. But as you might know, that the uh, the key spirit of a wireless system is that we want to keep layering of the system. So we, we because the sensor and the controller and the computing platform may come from different vendors. We we cannot like optimize uh, these different segmentations in, uh, in, in, in one system. So therefore, uh, our idea is that, okay, so we, we, we still focus on wireless communication over, uh, for V2X, but we, we want to seek for an appropriate timeless metric uh, rather than simply this uh, latency or throughput. This is our basic idea. Uh, so in literature, there have been some uh, proposals like age of information, uh, which is different from the delay. So which it is defined as the time elapsed from the generation of the most recently received packet. Uh, so um, for instance, in this case, we have uh, two devices and they are subject to the scheduling and comp competing for the wireless resources. So currently the device one has the packet with value five, which is generated five, four, four slots uh, ago. So the age of information is four slots. Similarly, for this second device, the age of information two slots. Uh, there, there have there also have been some other matrix proposed by other uh, scholars like nonlinear age, peak age, and age of synchronization, uh, etc. But the drawback of age of information is that it doesn't take the context into account. For instance, for instance, if the information is quite important in an emergency scenario. And also it doesn't take the error of information into account. For instance, in this case, even if the uh, this uh, age of information of the device is larger than the second device, but the error of the second device is larger as it and currently the status of the second device is nine and the error is uh, five rather than three for the first device. So therefore, Correspondingly, we uh, we propose a new matrix, namely the urgency of information. It has two components. The first component is the context. It should reflect the vehicle position and network status into account. And the second part is the error of uh, from from what the receiver know about the situation and uh, with respect to the true situation of of the of the variable that you are going to observe. You can just put ms mean square error into this dt or bounded error, or, or even it can be simplified to age of information just taking into account this uh, time elapsed from the generation of the packet. Um, and we also provide some rationale behind this urgency of information. For instance, if we want to uh, remotely control a, a car subject to a target trajectory, and, and what we can control is the velocity, but there is a disturbance due to uh, the environment. So the dynamic equation is like this. We have some uh, updates of the vehicle's true position subject to our control and the environment disturbance. So, uh, uh, so we want to minimize the square error of the trajectory from the XT versus the, uh, our target, but the control of the vehicle is done remotely based on the uh, up uplink status updates wirelessly from the uh, vehicle to, the, to our server, we can prove that if we want to achieve minimizing the uh, square stretch trajectory error, it is equivalently to minimize our proposed urgency of information with the uh, MSE as the error uh, uh, function. 
And then here come some equations. I'm not going to provide the details. Uh, basically, based on the uh, our matrix proposed, we uh, we we're trying to optimize the, the device scheduling. If we have multiple devices competing for the wireless channel, uh, how do we minimize the uh, average urgency of information of all the devices? And we uh, implement this idea into a, a simulation based on uh, an open source uh, uh, vehicular network uh, simulator, Sumo. And we, uh, <clears throat> we look at two diff uh, typical scenarios. One is, uh, uh, intersection without traffic light. So we schedule the vehicles and we want to enhance the efficiency of this intersection. And we can see that by using our uh, matrix, we can substantially reduce the, norm, the average trip time of, of each vehicle passing through this intersection. And the, the, the second scenario that we look at is the platooning of uh, multiple vehicles. Um, so one key matrix for platooning is the uh, safety distance between these different vehicles, especially for um, for the trucks, as uh, because for platooning, if the trucks can be more closer to uh, to each other, we can reduce the fuel consumption. Uh, and by doing, uh, but but the, on the other hand, if you allow the trucks to be very close to each other, the safety cannot be guaranteed because you have some randomness on the road. Uh, but by, by using our matrix, you, uh, we can greatly reduce the safe inter-vehicle distance, but at the same time, we can guarantee the safety uh, of the driving. And also we have a, a demo on, 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 on small vehicles, uh, so small cars that's uh, for the platooning. Uh, so this, the first scenario is that we don't have communication among these cars. So when the first car suddenly stops, they, they collide to each other because they don't have uh, sufficient time to react. They only measure the distance from the uh, front front car uh, through ultrasonic sensing. But if we allow communication uh, between different uh, demo cars, we can uh, we can avoid the collision. And so in this case, we have regular communication that uh, so that we have. Uh, uh, this uh, remaining distance. And, and th in this third scenario that we, we, al we apply our urgency of information, uh, we, uh, we achieve larger inter-vehicle distance after the emergency emergent stop, as you can see here. Uh, but actually we, uh, uh, from multiple experiments, we can see that using our urgency information matrix, we can um, reduce the safe distance inter-vehicle distance by 20%. Okay, that's uh, uh, about communications. Uh, on top of communications, actually uh, in this uh, vehicles, uh, autonomous driving scenario, as you can imagine, we sh the vehicles have to do uh, a huge amount of computing, uh, mainly for understanding the environment surrounding that vehicles for objective detection, et cetera. But, but but for autonomous driving, we should have at least 30 uh, frames per second for, for like uh, objective detection or even larger, I guess. But uh, each vehicle still faces energy and computation power limitation uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, so that's we, in order to enhance the FPS, like the, the computation rate subject to our energy and computation power limitation, we can actually exploit the sensors and the computing power of others. We can, uh, this is due to two reasons. One is that we can use the computing resource from uh, other, uh, for, uh, from, for instance, the edge server or other vehicles. And also we can use the, ca the, the, the video that captures by other vehicles so that we can see if the situation that might be blocked from the point of view of this uh, vehicle of interest. But again, you can imagine that all this should also be done in a timely manner. So we should jointly consider the uh, timeliness of the communication and computing. Um, so we take a very simple example and we have done some research. So most of these, uh, uh, most of the uh, applications are based on deep learning. Uh, so the, essentially you have to run a, a deep neural network 
uh, but due to the limitation of your computing capability, you might want to offload some of the, 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 the duty to the edge server. So that we have proposed a, a, a deep neural network splitting algorithms that we, we compute part of the deep neural network at the, at the vehicle and the rest on the edge server so that we, uh, we consider, we should consider the computation delay locally at the vehicle and the, for the transmission and for the rest of the neural network. And we want to optimize the total delay. Um, as you can imagine, we hope that because the edge server has powerful computation uh, capabilities so that we, we hopefully we can reduce the total delay even if we, we have this uh, wireless transmission in the loop. And then we design uh, the, uh, some communication and computation resource aware the deep neural network splitting and pruning. Uh, the result is that we can substantially reduce the uh, transmission load and the overall latency, uh, including the computing and transmission. And also the propo our proposed uh, joint pruning and uh, deep neural network splitting can achieve robust inference performance, even if we compress the model in a, in a very aggressive manner, like up, uh, over 90%. Uh, so we also uh, uh, demo our idea in this, uh, with these little cars. So, uh, in, in the uh, so, so in this scenario, the follower will follow the leader uh, and the leader will, uh, will drive in, on, uh, not on a straight line. So the follower should steal its wheels based on the de detection of the leader. Uh, if we do only the local computation, we have a small GPU on the follower uh, because the FPS is quite low. It's only like uh, it's only like nine FPS, so that uh, it's you can see that uh, the the follower doesn't uh, track the the curve of the, the leader very well because the the, F, the object detection rate is so low. But if we use our scheme uh, that we offload the deep neural network to the edge server, we can see that the, the tracking is much more smooth because in this case, we achieve 29 FPS, uh, even if we have a unre unreliable wireless communication in the loop. So that, okay. Uh, but, but as I just mentioned, in the wireless environment is volatile so that we have to decide which vehicle or which edge server should help me to do the computation. So this is a volatile network. So uh, in order to address this, we, uh, we propose some reinforcement learning scheme to, uh, to make that offloading decision. And, and since the wireless network is, also, is not reliable, you should uh, basically, if you want to be safe, you have to uh, offload the same task maybe to multiple servers or multiple helpers. Uh, but that comes with uh, efficiency, resource efficiency problem because you use more resources. So to improve that, uh, we uh, we actually uh, also we actually exploit the coding to the computation task so that we can utilize not only the wireless wireless resource but also the computation resource more efficiently. By doing so, we can also reduce the overall latency. Um, okay, uh, so. Uh, it's the, the latency reduction can be over 80%. Uh, so I think uh, this, this is the last slide of my talk today. Uh, so we are, because 5G is kind of commercialized. So we are, as a wireless researcher, we are now looking at 6G. Uh, but some uh, people in this area have uh, foreseen the, the, the uh, the paradigm change from like connected people to connect, connecting intelligence in 6G. But in 5G actually uh, uh, many applications uh, like uh, uh, IoT and uh, uh, machine, communica machine communications that actually 5G in my opinion is like connected, mach connected things. But in the future, because we have, uh, we will have computation capability for many different devices uh, as small as our glasses, or even to, to as large as uh, vehicles. So that's uh, the, the paradigm shift is to connected intelligence where as uh, I think the information timeless will play a very important role uh, in this uh, 6G uh, regime. Okay, that's all for my talk. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Zhao. Um, are there uh, any questions from uh, our panelists? And if not, then uh, we'll... I have a, oh, I have a oh, question. Sorry. So um, with respect to the urgency of information, it looks like it's actually quite general. Is there any limit to what kind of uh, this cost function DFP you can use with it? Uh, so currently, uh, we, uh, if you want to have a good mathematical derivations, currently we, we have put our focus mainly on the square error symmetry. Um, and also, I think uh, the D, D of T is, uh, is okay, but the, the hard part is uh, uh, the, the complex weight omega, t, omega of T, which is quite case dependent. Mm -hmm. So that's our uh, ongoing research. Uh, yes. We put, yes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. And thank I you. think we'll move on to then our next uh, presenter. Um, and now I'd like to welcome to the program, and I apologize in advance, uh, Dr. Wu. Uh, is it is it Wachang Wu? Is that how you pronounce your first name? Did I get that correct? Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so Professor Wu is the Deputy Director of the Institute of Microelectronics and the Beijing Innovation Center for Future Chips at Tsinghua University. He will be presenting on analog computing in memory with uh, MemRestore from device to systems. So please join me in welcoming Professor Wu. Thank you, Meta. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Great, great. So it's, it's my great pleasure today to participate in this USC THU Faculty Research Symposium. And today my topic will be analog computing in memory with MemRestore. And uh, I will talk about it from device to system. So I'm from the Tsinghua University. Mm -hmm. And uh, as everyone can experience the AI areas coming, they have many wide applications, you know, play the goal game and the driving uh, automation and uh, healthcare and many things. Behind that actually is a new trend. Actually, many larger or small companies are developing uh, chips, particularly to uh, support the AI uh, algorithm for their functions. So many, many companies are working on that and also lots of startups. So let's look at the, 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 the reason behind. So if you look at this, uh, this chart, you know, from the 1947, the ENIAC, they, that uh, very big computer can operate the 5,000 ad operations per second. And then right now for the CPU and the GPU, they can go up to like uh, T flops. And uh, if you look at the right side of this chart, the the black uh, black uh, square is indicate the CPU uh, computing computation power, and this is open square means the GPU uh, computation power. This is G flops per second. So what you can find out actually is is they pretty much follow the most law. When you put more device on the uh, unit area, you are you are gaining uh, more computing power. And the GPU because they can do more parallel, so so their computing power in certain area is much faster. Uh, but if you look at this red dots, actually showing the uh, the compute computation for training for the AI different uh, AI algorithm. You, if you look at them, you can find out uh, previously is double the requirements are double every two years. Since about 2011 or 2012, when uh, scientists started using GPU for training, actually, and also this algorithm become. And more and more complicated, the DNN become the network become more and more deeper. So you can find out uh, actually it's doubled every 3.4 months. And if you look at alpha go zero, <clears throat> the training required, this is per day, G flops times day. So you can find out this, there are bigger requirements and the, the single chip cannot uh, meet the requirements and the, uh, a lot of uh, chip set to meet the requirements still need a long day, long time for training. So it's case, uh, uh, bigger require uh, needs for the higher computing power chips. And so people are trying to do different ways. This is one example, last August in hard chips conference in Stanford. So here's a startup company called uh, Cerebras system. So they announced uh, this largest AI chips. If you look at the right part, this is the largest GPU. They have <coughs> 21 billion transistors. However, this is a bigger chip is actually 1.2 trillion transistors. The, the space is 46,000 square millimeters. 
So it's very huge, and they have 18 gigabyte on chip SRAM. So they are trying to put the chip very big to meet the uh, computing power requirements. Another example is like the Google, they develop a TPU, they have version one, version two, version three. And uh, so in this version three, because this computing requires lots of power, so by just fans are not enough or, or heat sinks are not enough, they actually use uh, activate, use the active, use the liquid cooling to cool the chip. So this power consumption, the heat is a bigger problem uh, also to uh, you know, uh, prevent, uh, to increase the uh, computing power. So if you look at the behind the, those issues, actually the traditional uh, the architecture have actually some uh, some drawbacks because we in our Vonilma architecture we normally we separate the computing with this uh, memory separate them out. But if you look at the speed between the memory, like CPU, they can compute like uh, less than one nanosecond. But for DRAM, the the time was roughly in about fifty to one hundred nanosecond. And if you go to flash, it will be even slower. So the memory speed is much slower than CPU speed. And if you look at the energy consumption, this is a chart, the, the table for the TSMC 45 nanometer technology node. So you can find out all the add operation, uh, might, multiply up operation, they consume less than one picojoule or a few picojoule, so it's very low. But if you look at the 32 bit DRAM read, the consume 640 picojoule. So it's also hundred times larger. So you can find out the memory is much slower, but also consume much higher power. So most time we call this memory war or power war. So those, come, those are reasons behind the uh, existing uh, uh, chip architecture, which you, or comp uh, computing architecture, which prevent uh, further increase the computing power. And also the Moore's law is slowing down also. So, but if you, in contrast, the brain is a very powerful and efficient intelligent computing computer. They have lots of neurons, lots of snaps, and also they highly intelligent, but only consume 20 watts power. So this is very efficient. So we try to learn from the brain. So sometimes we call it brain inspired computing. And so how can we mimic the brain with electronic systems? So we, if you look at this neural inspired computing, there are lots of different uh, perspectives. Some people look at this neural snap structure. So they have massive parallel. Okay, some people look at the spike event driving. Okay, this is STDP or different ways to drive a circuit. And they can try to achieve very low power. And also some scientists are looking for the in-memory computing or compute, computation in memory. So they try to use a different memory device like SRAM or flash or RAM or memristor as a device for the computing in memory. So either way they try to emulate the structure or try to emulate the working principle of this brain and try to learn from that and, and to improve our uh, hardware, uh, hardware computing uh, performance. And uh, today my talk will try to focus the uh, uh, RM device or sometimes we call it memory device. RM means a resistive random access memory. So it's this very simple device. Basically it's a two terminal device with a top electrode and a bottom electrode. Between them, you could have one layer or double layer or triple layer uh, material. And uh, the, this material under certain electrical field, they can form a filament or could be one filament or could be a couple of filaments. So this, when the filament formed, then this device is at a low uh, resistance range. And when we, we, if we apply a reverse electrical field and you, we can break this, rupture this uh, film and make this device back to a high uh, resistance state. So this become on and off. Because this device, this device is very simple. So they can be easily, easily integrated at the back end of the CMOS process when we choose the CMOS compatible material. So this is very nice. And also this, uh, uh, resistance state are uh, non volatile. So it's very, you don't have to refresh or, or keep the uh, current on. So this could be very low power. And uh, another interesting thing is that we can, by modulating this uh, filament, actually we can achieve this continuous set and a continuous reset, which is, is analog switching, which is very similar to the bio biological snaps. Sometimes we call it electro electrical snaps. So this could be used for the computation in memory. <clears throat> Especially in the many, many AI uh, algorithms, there are lots of uh, matrix uh, multiplication. In that case, if we mapping this uh, parameter x1, x2, x3 to this v1, v2, v3, the voltage, either with the amplitude of voltage or the pulse number of voltage, 
and we mapping this G11, G12, G13 weights to the uh, uh, the conductance of this G11 of this device. Then actually we can use Ohm's law. Okay, the V1 times G11, we can get the I, the current. Use Ohm's law to do the computing for the uh, my, uh, multiply. And then when we have this current together here, this is I11, I12, I13, we can use uh, Kirchhoff's law to finish the add. So this is very high efficient. Certainly this is analog computing because we use uh, computing on physics. And uh, so this is very different with, Tom normally we use, uh, we call it digital computing. So this is a very new uh, compute, uh, new way to do the computing. So why we believe the computation in memory is very highly op good opportunity. First of all, the most law is slowing down. So previously we used to try to put a more device in the unit area. It, this way is not a, cannot be go too far away and also cost is very high. And but in contrast, AI is much more computing power. And also because the memory war, uh, power war is a key bottleneck with the existing uh, uh, the separation of uh, existing architecture with the separation of computing and the memory. And this data transfer <clears throat> consume lots of power. And lastly, we find out uh, the intelligent computing for lots of AI application or even for lots of other applications, they don't require high precision computation. Basically, they don't require individual devices be very high precision. They actually, they require the system accuracy instead of cell bit accuracy. So if you find out for TPU, they also actually support a, a eight bit instead of you know a sixty four bit or more. But there are lots of challenges because this is a, a, a analog computing. So there are lots of requirements for memory device with stable uh, analog switching, and also because for the AI, there are many many different computing computation tasks. They have a different neural network. Then how can we adopt to the fixed hardware cost bar race, and then also the Periphery circular <clears throat> design could be also a challenge. Uh, that could be a trade-off and the, the, the architecture design. And the, on the comply level, uh, software level, 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 there are lots of work to mapping the multiple arrays without speed mismatch. So this is very important that we have cross layer uh, optimization methodology to achieve, really achieve this computation in memory work. <clears throat> so I like, uh, <clears throat> next I'd like to, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to review the recent uh, development of the computation memory with Memristor. So I, I, I divided this into three stages. The first stage is we actually call the, the device development. I mean, we still need to work, work, continuously work to optimize the device. That's still very, very important. But, uh, but I like to, you know, the, those stages are, they kind of overlap to each other. So <clears throat> the first stage is the device. From 2008, in the HP, the Stan William, they, they have the first experimental demo for the memorist. So, so this is very important work. And then later, the professor uh, Lu from University of Michigan, they, they propose this memorist uh, device can be also used for the artificial snaps. And the professor J Joshua Yang in the HP, he did a very excellent work, uh, published a paper in the National Nanotechnology. They gave a lot of guidance on how to design the, 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 the device for material and the device uh, 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 structure. And also he uh, proposed uh, proposed uh, discussed the, the way to do the memory store for computing, and also another very important work from my point of view, and many people believe that is because <clears throat> when the professor Yang moved to UMass, and uh, he he published a paper talk about the the diffusive memory store because this is more dynamic and actually snaps are also very dynamic. So this those are from my opinion is very important uh, work for the device. And also, I, I also heard that Professor Xiang is going to move to USC. That's a very, very exciting news. And I think that this will be really a bigger value to USC. And the, the second stage will be the, the memorist array level uh, demonstration. So in this case, uh, the, the memorist array level basically from the UCSB the dimmer, so he demonstrated the first one, the 12 by 12 array. So they do a very simple uh, pattern uh, classification. And uh, my group also demo one K array for the face uh, classification. And uh, this is another one for the sparse coding. And also UMass, uh, uh, Professor Sha and also Professor Yang did an eight K array for the MNIST uh, classification. So this is, I believe this in this stage from 2015 to 2018 is more like uh, the multiple uh, different group did the array level demonstration. <coughs> the, the third stage 
I, I think a lot more group are working with a chip and chip demonstration or some small system demonstration. Like from Panasonic in 2018, they do a macro. So they have an array and also the periphery circuits here, different circuits. And this is the, 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 the National Chihua University in Taiwan. So they did a one megabit array, work with the TSM together. So they did use the macro to demo, demonstrate the CNN. This is the last year ICCC. This year, actually, there are two works. And the one is the Stanford FIP1. And the, I also work with them together, also with the UCSD Professor Gert. So we did a macro. This is for the restrict uh, birds member scene demonstration. Another one is done by my group. It actually do the four chip integration, integrating all the uh, other other compute uh, other uh, calculation like a back uh, back propagation or, uh, or other function pooling. And the last one is also done by my group. Is actually we try to put eight small array together to build a small system. And uh, so this is a, a, so I, I think this is a third stage. So more, more chip work and the system chip work will be uh, showed. And to prove this way could, uh, could really do a, a very good uh, computing. And uh, this is my, our work uh, we just published in this uh, January. Basically we try to uh, implement a, a convolution neural network. So it's a five, uh, five layer neural network. And this is the hardware, this is the, the, the whole system the, uh, architecture. This is the uh, Hardware for each chip, we have two K array, so we have eight uh, small arrays here. So this is the array, it's not a, not a four chip for this one. So this is the architecture, and the, in, this is the, uh, the dual network is a five layer. So we have two convolution layer, we have the the uh, point two pooling layer. So this is all working, and lastly we have a four connection layer. And uh, in this work, we actually what we did, we have a few things we 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 put over here. First of all, we propose a hybrid training. Because in, in the analog computing, uh, some weight, uh, because right now device is not still optimized. So some device could drift a little bit and uh, which will impact the system accuracy. So we propose to, we do offline training and map all the parameter to the, to the array. And uh, when we find out uh, some accuracy loss, we can do the uh, online, uh, in still training for the last uh, four connect layer, we can recover the, all the accuracy. So this is the way we propose how to solve the, the, solve the issue. And, uh, and also we mentioned, we also discussed how to do parallel computing, uh, parallel. And uh, so we have different convolution layer together to make sure the speed are matched between the convolution layer and also for connect layer. Another one, what we did is actually, we believe to design a whole chip is very important. So we actually, based on that, we, we developed a end-to-end -end, uh, uh, simulator. So here we have from device to macro to the chip and also to the uh, algorithm. So for the uh, device level, we actually look at the, the, the physics of the device and we develop the compact, compact model. And for the array level, we look at this IR drop and also the device variation so on the array level. And for the chip level, we look at the different ties. You know, each tie have different arrays, cross bar arrays, and the, and the necessary uh, functions, periphery functions need to be included. And also how to do the network on chip, NOC, and then lastly, and because all the uh, algorithm are very, we have many, many variations. So we try to split them to the standard cross bar. So this will be important in a compliant way to, to solve that. So based on that, we actually designed this whole chip, this chip, this is published in this year's ISSC. So this is actually two, uh, this is not a, uh, uh, not a processor yet, but this is more like ASIC. So we, it's, a, it's a two layer MLP. And uh, for the MNIST, so in this case, uh, we try to propose this 2T2R cell structure so we can realize negative weights and reduce the IR drop. And also we propose a sign-based backpropagation uh, with a threshold, uh, a threshold uh, update rule so we can reduce the impact of device variation and the non-linearity. So there are different, uh, different ways to solve that. And, and I will skip this one. So basically we, 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 we uh, build the whole system so the whole system, we can do a demo and we can use the in, just the writing on, on the screen and they can recognize the, the, the data, the data, which is very nice. Actually, very interestingly, because this chip is based on uh, 130 nanometer technology node, but even that we can achieve 78.4 TOPS per watt uh, energy efficient, which is quite impressive. And so this is some comparison with uh, Panasonic uh, and the NTHU. So in this case, this is a four chip, and uh, this is the array is 
pretty good array size. Is the the precision is the the analog the ADC we can tunable from one bit to eight bit. So this is for this work. So finally, I want to give a last slide to talk uh, to show the my view for the future of this computation memory. We uh, we have our classic computer. So the bottom is the CMOS transistor, and then we have this uh, logical computing. Uh, okay, based the uh, different the uh, gates. And the, then the architecture is a new architecture. So we have developed the GPU, CPU, and then we have the assembly language compiler in different ways. I would imagine possibly it's not replacing the classic computer, but it could work together with the classic computer to make our life better. So could we use the analog memory as a device, bottom device? Then we use the computing on Felix almost law and different ways to do the computing. Then the architecture is a computation memory architecture. So we can de develop a different chips. In this case, to make the application program language people easier, then we should develop the compiler and the instruction set. And very importantly, the, the network mapping is very important. And also, we also did a look at this algorithm because at this moment, all the algorithms are based on digital computing. So this is for analog computing. This is something we also did a systematically to study that. So I hope by combining them together, we can achieve much higher energy efficient you know, for example, we can achieve like one pure per watt. So this will be really make our life, you know, the intelligent computing possible. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, questions? Nope. Okay. So I thank you so much. I think we can uh, move on then. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we would like to bring up uh, Dr. Bhaskar Krishnamachari, uh, Professor uh, Krishnamachari is a professor in the Ming Shi Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at USC Viterbi. And uh, he also has a joint appointment in our Department of Computer Science. Today, he will present privacy sensitive mobile based contact tracing for COVID 19. Please welcome Dr. Krishna Machari. Thank you, Maita. And uh, it's a pleasure to join you all uh, today. And uh, good morning to all of you in, in Beijing. So, um, so, in this talk, I want to touch on this area of contact tracing, which has very much been in the news in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but in fact, historically, uh, if we look at it, it goes back to the 1930s. Uh, there was work by the then Surgeon General of the United States, um, which was originally in the context of uh, syphilis uh, as an epidemic. And um, he was the first to really uh, articulate that one of the ways that you can contain an epidemic is to identify um, the chain of transmission, to identify um, you know, who had the case initially, who did they uh, potentially infect, and so on, um, so that you can really target your containment efforts to uh, particular portions of the, of the population. And uh, ever since that work, um, contact tracing has very much been a part of uh, dealing with epidemics of all shapes and sizes uh, since the since that time. Of course, in the context of uh, COVID-19, a number of countries have implemented contact tracing efforts. Traditionally, it's been a very manually intensive uh, operation. Um, Singapore is a great example where they, you know, have teams of contact tracers that reach out to every individual that has been uh, in contact with someone that is known to be uh, sick, and uh, there's a sort of very meticulous um, graph of all of the cases that have been identified in Singapore uh, so far. They're anonymized, but they give a lot of details about, you know, individuals, what locations they were in, um, you know, what their particular health status might be, etc. So, you know, for certain regions, it is possible to really do this as a very manual intensive process. Uh, but certainly a natural question to ask would be, you know, can technology help? And in particular, we've been interested for many years in uh, exploring how wireless technology can play a role in automating the process of collecting um, and logging contacts between individuals. And uh, in fact, at USC, one of the earliest studies we did on this subject goes back more than 10 years ago, um, back in 2008. 
uh, we gave to a class of freshmen um, mobile wireless devices to carry around for a week. And essentially these wireless devices were beaconing um, radio beacons that uh, other devices within range could log. And uh, the whole idea was to be able to collect information on who met whom, when, and for how long. And so you see here a few examples of the data sets that we collected. Uh, the figure on the left shows kind of a heartbeat, if you will, of the contacts between individuals. So um, the higher the peak, the more uh, individuals were in contact with each other. And so you can almost see, you know, times when these students met together as a group, um, you know, roughly 20, maybe 25, 26 hours after uh, the, the start of this timeline, you see kind of a correlated peak um, that corresponds perhaps to a subset of these students being in the same classroom. Um, and, and you can see sort of other smaller peaks corresponding to other groups of these students meeting each other and so on. Uh, the figure on the right shows a contact matrix where um, we're essentially just visualizing frequency of pairwise contacts between individuals. So um, this is just to say that, you know, the notion of using uh, wireless devices and radio beacons from those wireless devices and logging these beacons um, as a way of measuring uh, physical proximity of individuals uh, is something that goes back a long time. And certainly, you know, besides our own work in this space, there have been a number of other researchers that have advocated similar concepts since the 2000s. Uh, in the context specifically of COVID-19, these ideas uh, now are mature enough that many, many countries around the world um, have deployed uh, applications to um, allow uh, citizens essentially to log their contacts with others uh, near them and use this data essentially as, as a, uh, a way to scale up uh, contact tracing from something that's very manual intensive uh, to being more automated and uh, operational at, at some scale. So at the same time as these uh, apps have come out, at least in some quarters, there is a concern about privacy, um, this notion of very large scale fine-grained data being collected about who is near whom, when, and, and for how long. Um, I think really the concern has to do not with the public health use case, uh, but the concern that it might be used for purposes that go beyond public health. And so if there are uh, ways that we could improve the privacy for um, digital mobile-based uh, contact logging and contact tracing, uh, they could potentially be useful. So this is something that um, uh, I've been spending some time thinking about. In early March, I posted um, on Medium, which is a kind of a blog uh, article uh, type of site, um, an article where I proposed two protocols uh, for privacy sensitive contact tracing. And um, the thinking was, is there a way that you can have individuals um, still exchange and log some information, but in a way that they couldn't necessarily identify who the other individuals are? Um, and so uh, the two protocols that were proposed in this article, which we've since turned into a more technical um, work that is on archive, uh, essentially has these two phases. So in the first phase, uh, in both of the protocols, um, there's a slightly different way in which that beaconing is made anonymous. Um, but essentially, you've got two individuals that are near each other exchanging beacons uh, that, depending on the particulars of the protocol, might be a little different. Um, I won't get into that, that detail here, but essentially you're logging something that is an evidence of contact with another individual who is not identified. Uh, in the second stage, when one of these individuals uh, happens to be infected, uh, then along with a medical certificate, uh, since you don't want to have false alarms, but a medical certificate that says that they really are infected, the logs of that uh, person's phone are, with their consent, uploaded to a trusted third-party server, which verifies the, uh, the infection certificate and uh, makes this anonymous information available for others uh, and other devices to check privately if um, the data that's logged on their phones match what has been now uh, posted on a public third-party server. Uh, and even though this information is anonymous, uh, you're at least able to determine that if there is a positive um, match, that it means that you've been in range of someone that uh, has been detected to be infected, and uh, you could potentially then take some action to either self-quarantine 
or uh, get tested or take other measures. So the key here is that all of the information is anonymized. Uh, the information that is uploaded is only by infected patients. It is only with their consent. Uh, the information that is um, checked by the other parties also doesn't leak any identification and is kind of an entirely private process. So uh, these were some of the key elements of the protocols that I proposed in March. Um, after we developed these ideas, we actually communicated them uh, to folks in industry. We understood that if you're going to have a large scale adoption of a Bluetooth uh, proximity based uh, contact tracing app of this type, uh, it would be ideal for it to be done in the background uh, rather than kind of in the foreground of applications. And so really mobile operating system providers like Apple and Google have to step up and provide some way to, um, to make such an application work on their mobile platforms. Um, and indeed, about a month after that, uh, in early April, uh, Apple and Google announced that they would partner on uh, COVID-19 contact tracing technology. Um, uh, we are aware that our work has informed, uh, at least in part, um, their work. And, and also there was uh, work by other researchers um, out of Europe as well as uh, the US. And um, if you actually look at the details of the Apple Google protocol, um, it more or less matches identically with what I described earlier. This is uh, from Google, a description. Alice and Bob are uh, meeting each other for a 10 minute conversation. Their phones are exchanging anonymous identified uh, beacons, um, which are changing frequently. So that's one way in which this uh, anonymity is maintained. If Bob were to later be diagnosed with uh, COVID-19, then a, uh, an app from a public health authority um, has this information. And with Bob's consent, the uh, keys from the last two weeks are uploaded to the cloud and uh, they can, then can be used to notify uh, or help the others um, determine if they've been exposed. And, and they're, since then, they've started referring to this as exposure notification rather than contact tracing, because it's really this very decentralized uh, and private scheme. Um, we've been tracking contact tracing apps, uh, digital apps from around the world, more than 50 uh, of them. And so uh, we're aware of many, many efforts that are along the same lines, uh, others that are a little different. Um, there are some that are decentralized, some that are centralized, uh, others that are centralized and yet provide you know, different levels of uh, privacy and, and so on. Um, and I, I would like to mention uh, some work that we're doing in collaboration with one of these teams uh, out of Europe and Brazil to actually implement and deploy a contact uh, logging uh, Bluetooth based app. Uh, and in particular, we're trying to help them with one additional uh, technical question here, which has to do with, can you not just log the fact that you're in um, proximity of another individual, but also if possible, um, estimate the distance between these individuals. So not only are you logging how long they're near each other, but also how close they were to each other. And uh, we have some ideas and applying ideas uh, from, from uh, network localization and wireless sensor networks and the like to this problem of Bluetooth uh, distance estimation. And so we have some open source efforts uh, that we've made public and uh, that we're in the process of writing up as an uh, academic article as well. So, uh, you know, with respect to these privacy concerns, I do want to mention that this has been a, a topic of great interest in, in many quarters. Um, there's a great article by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which has talked about, you know, different safeguards that could be provided for such apps, uh, ranging from, you know, making sure that there's adequate consent, minimizing the types of data that are collected from individuals, securing um, these applications so that the data is not easily breached, uh, making sure there's a lot of transparency behind how these apps are architected and uh, put together, including making the source code open source and um, being very careful that, um, that there are not biases in how the technology is developed and deployed so that you know, people, for example, without access to technology uh, are not uh, unfairly or disproportionately disadvantaged. Um, and also this notion of expiration, particularly in the context of uh, you know, this infection, if you are going to collect some data to only log it for as long as it's really needed for the public health use case and um, to explicitly delete the data that is no longer needed. And I think, you know, more generally, this relates to the notion of thinking of data not only as an asset, but also as a liability uh, when it comes to privacy concerns. Um, finally, let me just uh, say very briefly that in some ongoing work, which is a little different from this uh, contact tracing explicitly, 
Um, we are in the process of uh, uh, doing some data-driven analyses of uh, risk associated with uh, COVID for our campus and uh, trying to understand, for example, you know, what is the uh, social network created by USC courses uh, you know, which courses are linked with which courses in terms of there being overlap uh, in the student populations. Um, and that can give us some ideas of, you know, what might be the risk, for example, associated with different levels of occupancy of classrooms. Um, hopefully we're, uh, you know, going to resume in, in a few months. And as we resume our, our normal operations, we still want to have some careful monitoring of the risk associated with it. Um, it, you know, it also involves um, trying to estimate queuing times, for example, outside our buildings. How long will it take people to safely go in and out of buildings if they need to keep certain physical distance uh, requirements and density requirements and so on? And this is uh, some ongoing work as well. Um, so just to summarize, I think, you know, digital contact tracing and exposure notification tools are going to be increasingly important, um, not only in the context of COVID-19, but I think for many years to come for all kinds of uh, future uh, epidemics that we might encounter, uh, but also that uh, at least as the state of the art is concerned, there's going to be some mix of manual and digital um, tracing that may be needed in different populations so that you can really focus on the most uh, vulnerable populations and locations. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, th there are sort of these two sides of the balance and, and uh, one has to be careful to uh, make sure that whatever system is deployed is really effective from a public health perspective, uh, but at the same time also balance privacy concerns, which can help uh, ultimately even with adoption um, of the technology and its effectiveness. So with that, I'll stop and uh, take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, do we have any questions out on the panel or from our audience? Uh, okay, doesn't look like, looks like you were very comprehensive. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now I uh, would like to welcome to the program uh, Samuel Gia. Professor Gia is an associate professor in the Center for Intelligent and Networked Systems and the Department of Automation at THU. He will present on decision-making for IoT-enabled smart buildings an event-based method. Thank you, Maita, for the introduction. I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, you should be, you Can should you be, it? there we go. Uh, All right. Um, there we go. Good morning for everyone in China and uh, good afternoon for everyone in LA. I'm wearing my USC Viator B red today. Uh, seems I physically cannot be there, but uh, I really appreciate everyone for making this uh, panel list possible. Today, I would like to share with you some of the results produced by my research group on how to make decisions for IoT enabled smart buildings. And we in particular are interested in a certain type of method we call it event-based. I come from the systems, the Center for Intelligent and Network Systems, uh, which is a branch in the BNRISD, the Bernrist Beijing National Research Center for Information Science and Technology here in Tsinghua. So first of all, what is this problem? When we talk about making buildings smart, we're talking about having a lot of devices and the sensors being incorporated in the building so that we can make people feel more comfortable and make the energy consumption more efficient. And in the same time, we want to make the building more safer. I mean, safer. And uh, that means in particular emergency situations, we can make the evacuation conducted in a faster and a more organized way. How to achieve that? First of all, let's talk about energy saving part of the buildings. We know China has a went through, gone through a difficult part of the time when we have a lot of smog spring in major cities across the country. Here are some snapshots of the pictures which was not taken by me, but instead taken by the major press here in China. So for example, this is the picture taken at the Tiananmen Square. That's the heart of the city of Beijing. And this is in Shanghai, and this is in southern part of China, which is not good. Therefore, the nation had determined to improve 
the energy efficiency to make uh, effective measurements to save energy and to protect the environment. This is not only a problem for China. As a matter of fact, it is a problem across the entire globe. For example, the building operation energy is very significant portion, over 40% of the US energy consumption on an annual basis. Currently, this number in China is only around 20%. But if we don't take effective measurements, then this number will rise up sharply in the very near future. On the other hand, for people like us, we want to use information to make decisions. And if we do that decision in a smart way, these are the numbers which we can save. For example, even if we don't generate new ways for energy generation, even if we don't develop new ways to make the building envelope, even if we don't generate new ways for running our industry, but only if we make better decisions, then overall, we can save more than 10% of the energy that is currently consumed in China. And that means we can save about 350 or 400 million pounds of standard coal. It's not just a matter of energy we're saving, it's actually a matter of how much dust and waste we emit into the entire atmosphere. That's a very significant number. Therefore, the question comes, is it easy? Not really. Well, if it is easy, I would not be sitting here and sharing these results with you. First of all, we have all of those ordinary challenges. We call them ordinary not because they're easy, but because they are so notorious, they have been well known, in this, at least in this field, for the past 50 or even longer time. One of them is the curse of dimensionality. It means if you are talking about how to make my own house smart, it is one thing, you may still be able to do it, but if you're talking about how to make the entire high rise building to be smarter, you have this curse of dimensionality because your search space will increase exponentially fast. And sometimes you can write down a beautiful equations, but you find out the parameter settings are so difficult. That's called the curse of modeling. And even if you can address the previous two challenges, you still have to consider how to make a smart decision for now and for the future. That's the multi-step decision-making process. On the other hand, we are decision makers. We need to make decisions based on the information we collect. Well, LADA, for example, is a very popular sensor used in a lot of autonomous driving tests. But we have shown that LADA fails to detect the sum of the objects. The glass in doors, the glass in windows are part of them. Therefore, information fusion is critical for intelligent and autonomous vehicles. Well, beyond those ordinary challenges, we also have those special challenges. On the one hand, those wind power generation are highly uncertain. Those charging demand from the electric vehicles are also highly uncertain. And we have so many different objective functions to achieve for individual users, for the entire transportation network, and for the entire suppliers. And they have to be achieved by the same system in the same time. Well, last but not least, we are dealing with a system with enormous scale. It actually across multiple time, as well as temporary and spatial resolutions. So if you want to have a good prediction for the wind power generation, you have to merge the information collected by the satellites, by those balloons we send out in the atmosphere, and we have to collect the data from the sensors we installed on the wind power turbines. So we have to fuse all of those three different sources of information to make more accurate prediction. How? If we're talking about artificial intelligence, but we have to be very careful. This particular type of AI technology in my talk is highly related to three fundamental technology advances in the very recent decade. One of them is the Internet of Things, which means we make the sensors so small, so energy efficient, so they can be embedded almost everywhere and to collect data almost 24 seven. Therefore, we have a big amount of data, but then the density of the information becomes usually smaller. Then we have those cloud computing, which make the computing as a service so easy to accessible. Therefore, the key question is how to make decisions. This is only one picture to show this uh, popular 
mathematical model for markup decision processes. It means if you have an initial system state and you take an action, the system changes, evolves according to a certain function. And after a while, you enter another state and the previous process will just iterate. Depending on how much cost that has been consumed during the course, we have an overall decision to make. Now, how to make that decision, especially how to make the optimal decision. People are talking about using every information we have by the time to make decision, but that is uh, such a large amount of data we're talking about. Therefore, we use the Markovian assumption, which says if you can have the current state, that will be enough for all the decision making, and your history doesn't matter anymore. Even if we have this Markovian property, you still suffer from a lot of the curse of dimensionality, the curse of modeling, as well as the previous ordinary challenges I have just mentioned. Therefore, I propose to use event-based reinforcement learning. So what is event? Event is, mathematically speaking, a set of state transition pairs. Therefore, events can be used to aggregate states, to aggregate states with the same kind of property. So for large systems, if I define event correctly, I can make the number of events to only increase linearly when the system scale increases, or even stay as a constant. And based on that, we have to notice the event is not, a, is not equivalent to the states. So it's mathematically equivalent to partially observable multiple decision process. So sometimes we can only achieve local optimal or approximate optimal. We have to combine event-based decision with reinforcement learning techniques. So what is reinforcement learning? This is only one picture to high level, uh, in a very high level to highlight the differences. On the left-hand side are the traditional methods, we call them Monte Carlo, for example. It means if I want to tell the consequences of my current action, I just run a simulation. And if there are uncertainty in the process, I run simulation multiple times. Then based on the sample average, I make a decision. I take the best action that I could achieve the best overall profit. On the right-hand side, this is not a Monte Carlo sampling. It says I only have one particular trajectory for the system. But if I look at it closely, I find out the similar or even the same state could occur by multiple times at different time slots. So if I regard this single long trajectory just as multiple simulations from the same state, then I have multiple samples for different action candidates. The same thing happens for the red states, the blue states, the yellow states, the green states, actually, as a matter of fact, for every state that's shown up in this sample pass. So based on that, using only a single sample pass, I can tell you the differences between taking different actions. So on the left-hand side, if you want to use this model to make decision, you have to hire experts like me to build up the simulation model, to justify it, to verify it, to validate it, and then you can make decision based on that. On the right-hand side, you don't need experts like me. You, as a matter of fact, you don't need any expert. You only need to buy your sensors, install sensors to collect data. Then you have the data-based decision making. That's why people love it, because you know the sensors are much cheaper than experts to hire. Now, what is the, uh, the fuzz of uh, the deep learning? What deep learning means, if I collect every data that showed up in the history, even if you do that, well, there is still a large number of combinations of the state and action which does not show before. How do I predict the consequences? for those particular state action pair or event action pair, the answer is you have to approximate. That is why we combine event-based decision with deep learning, so that you can predict the consequences of our actions, even if those actions never occurred before. Now, basically the fundamental theory has been introduced. I'm using that theory for some real applications. This is a particular one. Let's say on the right-hand side, I wake up in the morning in my house and I drive my car to work. Even if I find a way to park my car and connect it to the power grid to charge my car, my EV, here comes the question. What is the power that is being used to charge your car? 
If you are charging your car by the regular state grid, actually driving an EV won't help you to save energy, won't help you to make the environment to be more sustainable. You're just uh, shifting where this CO2 is emitted from one place to another. You don't reduce the overall amount. But if you charge your EV by this wind power or other source of renewable power that is generated locally in this high rise building, then you actually save energy and then you actually reduce the CO2 emission. Are, are we talking about dreams? We have to justify our research by real data. So this is some real data. If we have all of those high rise buildings within the four ring in Beijing, there are more than 900 such high rise buildings which are higher, taller than 50 meters. And even if we talk about the buildings which are taller than 100 meters, there are still more than 300 such buildings in the city of Beijing. If we deploy on top of those buildings this right type of wind turbines, then for one year, let's say in the year of 2016, the overall power generated by this high rise building mounted wind power generators would be sufficient to power up all the electric vehicles in that particular year in Beijing. I'm talking about more than 50,000 electric vehicles. So what does that mean? That means, well, actually you got to uh, not just uh, uh, cost free to drive EV if you do this, but actually the government should pay you something because you're helping the entire state grid to uh, save a lot of load. But this decision making is not trivial. The previous conclusion is based on a very huge assumption, that being you have a large power storage device. Whenever you have renewable power, you charge it. Whenever you have an EV want to be charged, you discharge from that storage. But even if I don't, if I don't have that huge storage, is the answer still yes? The research results from my group shows the answer is yes, but you have to handle a huge and challenging decision-making problem, which is shown here. On the left-hand side, you have the power supplied by wind, which is free, but very random, almost free, or you purchase the power one day ahead, which is regularly much cheaper than the real-time market. On the right-hand side, we have the power charging demand from all the EVs. You have to balance the two sides. For the whole day, on the right hand side, you have the wind power generation curve, which is almost free, but very random. In the middle, you have the purchased power from one day ahead, and you have this power purchase in real time, which is very expensive. The combination of all three is the generation curve. They have to match the left hand side, which is the charging demand curve from the multiple trips of the multiple EVs in the whole day. And the two curves have to match with each other perfectly. Now, we know this wind power generation and the driving and the charging demand on the EVs are very random. And we have to make our decisions uh, by multiple time stage in the same time because my power storage device only have a very finite capacity. And the information is across a multiple time scale. If I buy power one day ahead, which is cheaper, my information is not very accurate. If I buy my power in real time, your information is accurate, but the price went up. So how do I buy? The basic idea is divide and conquer. First of all, you aggregate all the charging demand from the EVs into an aggregated demand. And then you split them among the EV to decide how much power each EV is charged according to how urgent their charging demand is. So based on this idea, our group has been doing a research in this area for almost one decade. We are able to show right now by combining this event-based reinforcement learning with a model predictive control, we can make decisions in two different time scale almost perfectly. So in a particular parameter setting, this bi-level decision making can save the cost by more than one third and actually can improve the penetration of the renewables by a significant amount, more than one quarter. Overall, this belongs to the multi-scale policy optimization. 
in which you have the simulation models at different resolutions. So how do you solve this problem? You have to find this minimum spatial temporary unit. And based on that, we rebuild the entire decision-making model so that you can solve it uh, very effectively. And last but not least, I would like to use about one or two minutes to talk about the fast evacuation. When we have a lot of IoT devices installed in the buildings, you can tell people where to run during an emergency situation. But sometimes they don't listen to you. So how do you do that? I would like to share with you um, a particular example. So we're talking about how to use the information to help the firefighters to enter and to retreat from a fire situation. Uh, we conducted a research in our FIT building. For many of you who have physically been here, you know this building. So you can wear this device and then, uh, which basically is a HoloLens, then you can see this is a three-dimensional model in this FIT building and which is hands-free uh, to interact with the model. You pick a particular room where you wanna go uh, because there might be people getting stuck in that particular room. Then you just double click to select this particular room and this uh, map will be automatically lo loaded into the system, running the algorithm to give you a guidance. Then in front of you, you can see a red arrow. You just follow that arrow to climb the stairs to take the elevators and uh, the visual camera can even catch this ordinary regular green uh, signs. You merge with that to improve your visual. Uh, we can enhance your visual experience by telling you which are the walls, the settings and the safe areas for you to pursue. Now eventually you can get to your destination and uh, be effective. So by using this uh, IoT devices, uh, we can actually improve how people evacuate and how firefighters fire the uh, fight, the fire. All right, let me get back to the very last page of my presentation. So, in brief summary, the IoT-enabled smart buildings may improve the energy efficiency significantly by smart decision-making. And event-based reinforcement learning addresses the critical dimensionality in some extent and explores the multi-scale structure of the problem. This method can be applied to EV charging in smart city and for fast evacuation in smart buildings, the same set of theory, but for two different problems, both in smart buildings. Decision-making for IoT is critical for global sustainability. And this is not the end. It's actually only the beginning of, not even the beginning of the end, but the end of the beginning, because we have a lot of people who share the same research interest with us. We have been organizing special sessions and workshops for uh, smart decision-making in cities and in several flagship conferences in IEEE Control System Society, Robotics and Automation Society, for example. And these are some books we have been written and published on the same topic. And that will be the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gia. That was um, quite interesting uh, as the non-engineer in the room. Um, are there any uh, questions? Nope, okay. Uh, all right, well then, thank you again. And we will now move on to our uh, final speaker. Um, I would like to welcome Sean Wren. Uh, Professor Wren is the Director of Intelligence and Knowledge Discovery Research Lab, an Assistant Professor of Computer Science, and is also affiliated with the Information Sciences Institute at USC Viterbi and he will present on label efficient learning with explanation and background knowledge. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ren. Thanks uh, for the introduction. Um, can you guys see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see your screen. 
Awesome. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good morning to the um, folks in um, Chinatown and uh, also good evening to the folks from USC. I'm Xiang. Uh, I'm a um, assistant professor at CS at USC. Uh, I've been mainly working on natural language processing and uh, applied machine learning. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to um, focus a little bit more on how to make this learning process much more label efficient so that we can make it uh, um, cheaper and, uh, and also more transparent to be, uh, um, to be uh, leveraged. So I want to start the talk with um, give you a brief um, summary of what is the um, learning um, pipeline looks like right now for modern natural language processing. Um, if we look at what these people have been doing in both academia and industry, so we can um, kind of easily identify a shared pattern, which is um, I can have, uh, uh, I can uh, pick up uh, some state-of-the-art neural model architectures, um, and then I can collect some data and find people to annotate for the labels, and then I can find a computing platforms, uh, most likely including some GPU resources, and altogether I can learn a, a, a model which works very well in a range of different natural language processing applications. Uh, and to be more uh, looking more closely at um, each um, component of the, the recipes I just talked about, you can find out that um, for models actually right now in NLP, um, the, the model architecture starting to become like a um, um, commodity uh, where one model architecture actually can be applied to a, a bunch of many different applications. Uh, for example, um, summarizing news articles, predicting the sentiments for the social media post, uh, generating um, 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 uh, response in the dialogue systems or um, other um, things you can think of. They could all be rely on a single model architecture. And in the really in the implementations, it's just maybe two lines of code right now. Give uh, thanks for all these efforts of open sourcing and, and unifying these uh, neural architectures. Um, so maybe you are happy with a certain model like BIRD, um, which is a, one example of the transformer family. And if you are, if it, the next month there's a new model coming in, you can just simply change the codes um, to import a new version of the model, right? And um, what about the computing powers? Turns out with this all the cloud computing resources, this also become like a modality type of uh, resources where uh, with one or two lines of codes on this cloud computing platform, you can easily switch from uh, a, a smaller uh, memory GPUs to a, a, a much larger node and to empower um, more um, data resources. Um, but then the, the missing piece here turns out to be the label data, where um, we found out that model architectures and computing power actually are quite transferable across different downstream applications um, for NLP, but the label data is still quite domain specific or task specific. Just to give you a more concrete example here. Um, so let me pick the relation extraction task uh, as a, um, a demonstration. The task is basically um, giving you two uh, mentions of en entities in a sentence like uh, Bill Mays and um, Tom Park here and ask you what are the um, type of relations uh, can best describe these two entities in a given sentence. So you need to read through the sentence um, and understand what it's talking about. And in this particular example, it's talking about the um, tam tampar is actually the, the place of um, where the person died, um, given the context, right? So in order to uh, in, um, in kind of promote the research on these problems, which can be applied to a range of different things like uh, uh, building knowledge graph from uh, social media text or um, moderating the um, um, user generated content. Um, in order to promote the research on that, um, there's uh, very nice efforts um, building different data sets, especially large scale data sets um, for this type of problem. One example is this TechRa data sets, which is over 100,000 label instances for 40 different relation types. And they do this by um, purely using cross-sourcing um, um, platforms like Ma Amazon Mechanical Turk. And they do this in a very careful way where they actually um, create multi-choice questions out of each instances to solicit what is the right label. Um, and looking at the cost of this whole process, it's actually um, quite um, expensive 
uh, both in terms of the time cost and also the um, the cost on hiring these workers. So, for example, finishing the entire uh, annotating the entire data sets by assuming one instance takes 20 seconds and this can be parallelized by multiple workers. Actually, it will still take you more than one week to finish everything. And it's going to take you 50,000 do, um, do, US dollars to do this job. Um, so this is just one example of a relatively simple task in natural language processing actually could cost you this much of uh, resources to create uh, just one data set. Um, so of course, there's tons of efforts trying to lower the, um, um, the reliance on training examples um, or towards faster learning process, including like multitask learning, transfer learning, active learning, and distance supervisions in conjunction with some uh, open knowledge graphs or knowledge bases, right? But the, this line of work, um, they all have these uh, strong assumptions on what is the data distributions and how well these data distributions uh, align with each other. For example, uh, if you have a data set that looks rather different, from the existing data sets, then this kind of methods probably won't apply well um, to the case. And we are looking at this problem from a rather different angle. Um, we still want to um, get help from human, but we want to do this in a much uh, efficient and smarter way. Um, so one um, thing we've been uh, really enthusiastic about is trying to solicit human supervisions in the form of uh, natural language explanations, like by like, for example, uh, I can learn a model by just talking to a human experts, uh, maybe not even a human expert, just some old, uh, just normal users, just uh, taking the same, uh, same task examples here uh, for like the relation extraction. Um, if I can ask a user, um, what do they think is the right relations describing these two entities uh, in a given sentence, in addition to that, I also asked them to describe why they come to such a decision, or why they predict such a label. And they could tell me, uh, I see some words uh, showing, uh, showing up in the sentence between these two entities, and I see some other linguistic patterns between that. They can type in these, um, these type of explanations uh, with the help of a user interface. That would be really helpful. Um, and we will show in the later work, uh, in the later part of the talk, how we can make this um, explanations being leveraged to train the model uh, in a much more efficient way, um, um, what we call label efficient, which means like given the same amount of time, we can learn a model that is performing much better than training the model with the traditional um, supervision um, format. So uh, I want to, um, with the given time, I want to just very briefly touch on three questions um, and and, and for each question, I'm going to answer, uh, answer them um, at a very high level with the, uh, the ideas that we propose from different papers. So the questions um, here are, um, can we actually do the uh, model learning um, with rules instead of, instead of with those label instances? And, and one step further, can we actually handle the um, the human's natural language uh, explanations instead of just those semi-structural or structural rules. And the third question is actually a little bit switching the gear to words. Can we leverage some previous knowledge uh, in the human mind uh, as some sort of inductive bias to further lower the uh, reliance on training examples? So, uh, yeah, before I dive into what we're doing, um, just to kind of uh, recap on the standard pipeline of how people are doing uh, data annotations in NLP right now. So you are given a bunch of uh, unlabeled data. For example, I'm still using the uh, relation extraction as the running example here. Um, you are given two entities in a sentence and you are asking human annotator to give you the uh, right label for each instance. So here, all of these instances are talking about the a person is the, uh, is the founder of a company um, and they are different only in a very subtle way, like the subject and object are different and then the time stamps are different, right? Things are, other than that are pretty similar for this set of sentences. So uh, instead of asking annotator to go through sentence by sentence and give labels, which is slow and you have a lot of redundant efforts done in this way, uh, there's very earlier effort saying, 
can I actually ask the human to write down some patterns? Uh, think like uh, if I see a phrase like A was founded by B, uh, and I can match these patterns to some instances, I can sort of confidently annotate those instances with this label, right? Um, and this actually is very, uh, very classical, but very powerful idea and still be applied in many industry uh, features and products right now. Um, but there are still limitations with these methods, which is um, this kind of matching is very, uh, it's done by some exact stream matching and it's not very flexible. What if there's some subtle changes on the language? For example, here you can see, what if I see a sentence like Microsoft was established by Bill Gates instead of seeing Microsoft was founded by Bill Gates, right? And this, these single patterns will fail on these instances because they cannot explore the semantic variations uh, in the language. So that kind of create a research problem for our, the first part of the talk, which is how you can do soft matching between these kind of very semantically similar patterns and sentences. So the uh, students, Wen Xian uh, proposed this work, which is actually uh, fortunately to be actually nominated as the best paper candidate in the, the web conference this year. Um, and the idea is actually quite, um, um, elegant. Um, so there, so with this rules, let's assume we have a bunch of rules written by human can, uh, and I can do hard matching or, or exact stream matching to identify a bunch of instances that can exactly match my patterns, but that would be just, uh, the minority of the instances we have so far. Um, the majority of them will still be unmatchable to this, uh, regarding this set of rules. And towards those things, we want to propose a module that can do soft matching. Uh, and what this soft matching module is trying to do is just like given a sentence, given a rule, I can output a numerical score between zero and one indicating how likely this, this rule can match this instance. Um, and with that um, confidence score or matching score, we can do a joint learning with the hard match examples to try to classify in a more effective way. Um, compared to only using the hard match instances, right? Um, and that's so the out, um, so the 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 um, the end product we are actually um, expecting here is the final classifier. But of course, the soft matching module in our case it's a learnable neural network which will be jointly trained in the whole framework. Um, so I won't dive into too much detail, but the soft matching module is essentially a, a smaller neural network which is encoding the pattern as a sequence and encoding the sentence as a sequence in uh, encoding both of them as a, into a vector representations and then do a, a, a parametrized cosine functions to compute a, a, a similarity score between zero and one. So um, one thing I want to highlight as the result of this work is what we call label efficiency, which is kind of a little bit different from what the uh, community usually will show in their um, final experiments uh, as a, just one single number talking about whether this model is doing good or bad. Here we want to control the performance over time, which means like if I only give you 40 minutes to annotate data plus learning um, um, and after you annotate the data, you can learn whatever model you like and then I will evaluate how the model performs. If I give you such a constraint setting, how would different approaches perform? So here we take into account the way you um, you surprise the model and, and, the, and the format you create the training data. Um, so these two curves, the blue curves showing the, um, the amount of rules we can obtain with a given time and the, the orange line is the amount of sentences we can annotate. They are actually not too far away from each other, but if you're looking at using that set of sentence to train a standard model versus using the rules to train our to train the model in, in uh, our using our proposed methods, the performance of these two models will be actually uh, having a huge difference. Uh, with one is only is almost close to zeros as a test set performance. The other one using our approach can achieve about forty two F one score. Um, so that's a huge improvement here. Um, and as you can see, only spending a limited amount of time, we can still get uh, some usable models for a downstream task. So right now we are talking about the rules and patterns, which seems pretty limited and it's not very natural to uh, solicit them from the 
users. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how can we actually take in human explanations to do this same job. Same job. Um, so for example, uh, for sentiment analysis, I can say this sentence is positive because I see the words very nice. It's within three words after the entity. Uh, for relations, I can say I saw some phrases appear between these two entities in the sentence. And, and these sentences actually can be parsed into some structure form. Uh, I won't go into the details, but basically we can follow some pre-existing framework to translate this natural language sentence into some what we call labeling functions, which can be executed over some new instances by doing hard matching. For example, uh, if I have another sentence, I want to know its sentiments. And if it happens that I have a labeling functions that can match the features in that sentence, I would know that sentence is annotated as either positive or negative in terms of sentiments. Again, the, uh, the issues of language variation um, uh, arise here, and we are hoping for a soft matching module can handle this, uh, um, this challenge. And uh, here in this IKEA paper, we actually propose a framework to do this soft matching. Um, when you are given a labeling function and you are given uh, a lot of unlabeled sentences, um, we are proposing a module called execution chi which can, which is consisting of several uh, modules. Uh, some are in charge of matching string, some are in charge of computing the logic, and some are in charge of counting, and so on. It's like basically a program with some um, functions, and these functions are having learnable parameters. And the high-level idea is basically we are um, recursively computing um, the compounds in the labeling functions and get a score on each words of the sentence. And this score can be further composed into uh, um, um, other scores. And regressively, we can get the final uh, uh, soft matching score between a explanation and a sentence. Again, we're doing something similar uh, in our final experiments to look at the label efficiency. And we found out that um, we, by annotating label plus explanations is roughly only taking twice of the time uh, as compared to only labeling, uh, only, uh, only annotating the label. Um, but the performance um, trend with explanation is much better than, um, than the performance of the model trend with only the labels. So it's actually about 10 times or 15 times of uh, uh, what we call speed up in terms of training in, in this sense. Um, I think they um, just quickly touch about the last point um, with the limited time left. Uh, I think the final um, 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 topic I want to touch on is like, um, in addition to getting this explanation from human, can we just make use of pre-existing knowledge uh, for um, helping the models to learn? Um, and I want to just talk about this in the context of common sense of question answering. Um, this is a kind of popular um, task um, um, in NLP community right now where people are just posting very daily, um, daily life questions um, to machines and see if they can actually under understand these questions and answer them in a correct way. For example, where do adults usually use glue sticks? And you have choices like classrooms versus office versus desk drawer. It's, there's some subtle uh, common sense knowledge you need to leverage. For example, you will see that adults will be more likely to show up in office than in classroom. So the glue sticks might be more likely to use in office or, uh, than in classroom, right? Um, and the kind of the general practice for the community to solve this type of question, it's just relying on these like huge um, language models called BERT or transformers. Um, but these models are, even though they could be successful when there's sufficient amount of training data, but they are also very sensitive to the amount of training data you could provide to it. For example, if you just reduce the number of training uh, examples by 10%, the performance uh, on these leaderboards could be dropped by 20% or even more. So they are quite uh, sensitive to the um, labels. Um, meanwhile, these models actually work in a very black box manner. So you are not really sure about what pieces of uh, common sense knowledge was leveraged in answering each question. Um, or put it in another way, 
they could be making the right decisions with wrong reasons. Um, and you don't know about it. That's quite um, um, uh, dangerous when you put into real life uh, applications. So our proposal here is to say, in addition to just encoding these questions into some black box embedding space, um, we want, also want to augment this answering process with some symbolic um, space that can be interpretable to human. And this symbolic space will be constructed by referencing some external um, knowledge graph. In this particular case, we consider a concept map uh, so that we can borrow the knowledge from concept map and also make the whole process more interpretable. Um, taking the same example here, um, if we can know that the adults um, is capable of work and work um, happens in office, of course, working cannot also happen in other places. But at the same time, adults is capable of use and the use um, can be applied to glue stick and glue stick can be located at office. And these are all external knowledge that was uh, stored in this knowledge graph could be retrieved and used to construct this symbolic space such that um, we can rely on both the graph and the sentence to make inference and to get to the right answer. So that's basically the high level idea of our proposed uh, method, which encode the question and answer into vector space and, and then encode a graph also into a vector space and then combine the, um, the texture representation and the graph representation to reach to the final answer, which is basically a plausibility score for each of the choices that you have for the question. Um, and at the time when we published uh, um, the work, we actually ranked the top um, on the leaderboard. And there's a, uh, a bunch of follow-up work um, trying to extend our idea to more powerful language models and more powerful um, graph neural network architectures. So with that, I want to conclude. Um, I think I mainly talk about some um, kind of initial ideas about leveraging high-level human supervisions. Um, they could be abstracted, could be compositional, could be uh, linguistically complex uh, by showing the answers to these three questions. Uh, our lab also done um, other work, uh, for example, learning from distance supervisions and doing reasoning over heterogeneous event data, for example. Uh, I would thank my students and collaborators. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if there's any. Thank you, Dr. Ren. Uh, and we'll see if there were any last questions. If not, okay, then uh, this will bring us to the end of our symposium. Um, thank you to all of you who at are attended. We hope you enjoyed these presentations. Um, we did record these sessions today and yesterday. And as soon as the recordings and the slide decks are all available, we will keep you posted. I want to thank again the coordinators of this conference, Professors Raghavendra and Wu, uh, you, sorry, excuse me, and especially to all 12 of our faculty presenters over the last two days. As this was our first online faculty symposium, it was definitely an experience like no other, and we hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, if all of the presenters uh, will stay on for just um, one more moment and turn all your cameras on, we'd love to take a quick picture of everyone together. And for um, everyone else, we again, thank you for joining us. And uh, good night to those of you who are in Los Angeles and a great rest of the day to those of you that are in Beijing. And as we say here at USC, fight on. Fight on. Yeah, thanks, Maida, for moderating the session today. And uh, I'd like to also thank all the speakers today. Very interesting talks. And